Many people grew up with older consoles and handhelds, such as the Game Boy or the SNES. These retro consoles had a limited colour palette, and the art direction of these games reflected the restrictions placed upon artists. Recently, there's been a revival of classic consoles such as these, with Nintendo cashing in on their fans' nostalgia for the NES and the SNES Classic. Today, we're going to use Shadergraph to replicate the unique colour palette restrictions of these consoles, starting with the original Game Boy. The original Game Boy could only display four colours, each a different shade of green. The easiest way for us to make a shader to automatically transform an object to Game Boy colours would be to calculate the luminance of each pixel, then match that up to the four colours, from darkest to lightest. So that's what we're going to do. There are two main ways of doing this, so I will show you how to do both. For the first method, start by creating a new unlit graph by going to the project view and selecting Create, Shader, Unlit Graph, and name it Game Boy. We're going to write a shader which takes lighting into account, but we don't want Unity to automatically apply the lighting, so we won't be using a PBR graph. To start off, we need to add the properties for this shader. We'll need to add a main texture of type Texture2D. This will control the base colour of the object before the Game Boy colour transformation is applied. After that, we're going to add four colour properties for each of the Game Boy's four colours. I'm going to name them Darkest, Dark, Light, and Lightest, and give them each a default value based on the Game Boy's original colour palette. I put the hex values in the video description to make things easier for you to copy them over. Finally, we'll add a keyword to control whether to take lighting into account. That way, you can control whether you're enabling or disabling the lighting using a checkbox on the material inspector. Go to keyword, boolean, and name it something descriptive, like use lighting, with a reference value of use underscore lighting underscore on. The underscore on is important to make sure you include that bit. We want to modify lighting information inside shader graph, but unfortunately, there's not yet a node that lets us access it. Fortunately, we can write our own custom nodes using Shadergraph. I'm basing this part of the video on an excellent article by Alex Lindman on the Unity blog site, so if you're not interested in code, you can just copy the required code from her article under the Using the Custom Function File Mode subheading, and skip to the timestamp on screen to avoid a more in-depth discussion of the code. The link to this article is in the description. Start by creating a new file. We're going to write a single function with a void return type called mainlight underscore half. The half is important because this tells Unity the precision to expect this function to use. We'll see later that we can override the precision used, so if we wanted to write another function called mainlight underscore float, we could, but we won't worry about that here. This function is going to output diffuse lighting information from a single light, but you can include specular light and additional point lights if you follow the rest of that article. This function's parameters are a float free called world pause. This will be the world position of the pixel. An out float free called direction, which lets us output the light's direction to our shader graph. An out half free called color to denote the light color. And finally, two half parameters called distance atten and shadow atten to output the light attenuation due to distance and presence of shadows, respectively. Attenuation just means that the light strength has a smooth fall off over distance and in shadow. When this code is running on an object in Shader Graph, we need to create a fake light to make sure that the preview windows are rendered properly. Use the hash if Shader Graph preview directive to check if we're inside a preview window, and if so, create some default values for each of the four output variables. Else, the code is likely running in the scene or game view so it should be able to find a real light to work with. Between the hash else and hash end if, we'll need to use a hash if shadows underscore screen, because some types of light apply shadow maps in screen space. In that case, we can first transform the world pause we passed into the function from world space to clip space using the transform world to h clip function, then convert it to a shadow coordinate using compute screens pause. Otherwise, if shadows underscore screen is not defined, that means shadows are calculated on the object's geometry instead, so we can just use transform world to shadow coord. Once we've got the shadow coordinates, we can grab the main light using get main light, making sure that we pass in shadow coord to get the correct shadow attenuation for our pixel's world position. 
The light gives us direct access to each of the four output variables, so just set each of them in turn, and then the script is complete. Save it somewhere sensible as an HLSL file. I've called mine lighting.hlsl. Return to the Game Boy shader graph and create a new custom function node. By clicking the cog menu, we can insert custom shader code into this node, and modify the inputs and outputs to the node to match the parameters of the function we just wrote. Go ahead and add a single input called worldpos of type vector3, then four outputs called direction, color, distance of 10, and shadow of 10 of types vector3, vector3, vector1, and vector1 respectively. We'll need to type the name of the function in the name field, but leave out the underscore half and just type main light. Then attach the lighting.hlsl file we just wrote to the source field. Finally, we need to set the precision at the top to half, and our node should turn an off green colour. Now we can create a new position node in world space and hook that up to the world pause input on the custom function node. Now that we can access diffuse lighting information, we need to apply that to our mesh by using the dot product between the normal vector of the mesh and the direction of the light. On the preview, you'll see it shows us a lit sphere as intended. Use a saturate node to make sure that the values are bound between 0 and 1, then we'll apply the shadow and distance attenuation, and the colour by multiplying all of them together using two new multiply nodes. Then finally, use another multiply node to tie everything together. I'm also going to go one step further and add the scene's ambient light. We can output all this to the colour pen on the unlit master node to see the final preview of what the lighting looks like. There's still a lot more to do with this Game Boy shader, and all this lighting code is going to be needed later on in other shader graphs. Rather than copy-pasting this entire network of nodes, we can select all of them except the master node, right-click and select Convert to Subgraph. A subgraph allows us to wrap a group of nodes together and then use them in additional shader graphs as if they're one node. We'll name this subgraph something along the lines of Get Lighting, and the Game Boy graph will update accordingly to show only a Get Lighting node feeding into the colour pen. If we look at the Get Lighting graph, all the nodes are connected in the same way. The only exception is that there's a new output node. We can rename it by going to the cog menu, double clicking the name of the output, and then let's call it something like light. If we go back to the Game Boy graph again, the name will update accordingly. Now we can apply the lighting to the model. Drag the main texture onto the graph and use a sample texture 2D node to grab the albedo color for this object. If we then multiply by the light value from get lighting, it'll apply the lighting to our base texture. However, we also included use lighting as an optional keyword, so we'll need to use that keywords node to tell Unity which values to use when lighting is on or off. Pass the result of the multiply into the on slot, then pass the RGBA output of the sample texture 2D node to the off slot. Now, the output of the use lighting keyword node gives us a lit or unlit texture based on whether use lighting is ticked. Next, we need to determine the luminance, or brightness, of the pixel. We can do that by using the dot product of the pixel's colour with a new vector free with values 0.2126, 0.7152, and 0.0722. You won't see a difference immediately because our default texture is already grayscale, so if we mess with the main texture value to give it something that has colour, we will see a change between the previews on use lighting and dot product. Finally, we will determine which Game Boy green colour to use based on the luminance value. We can do this by using a comparison node, which compares the A and B values based on the comparison type specified in the drop down menu. We're going to check for the pixel luminance greater than 0.75, which we pass into a predicate node. For its true output, pass in the lightest property. In effect, we're saying if the luminance is greater than 0.75, then output the lightest green. We'll need to pass something into the false slot. For that, create another comparison node to check if the luminance is greater than 0.5. The result gets output to another branch node with the light property slotted into the true field. The output of that branch node will be output to the false field of the previous branch node. Finally, to factor in the final two colours, create a third comparison node to check if the luminance is greater than 0.25. Output that to a third new branch node and slot the dark property into the true field, and the darkest property into the false field. The output of the third branch can be input to the second branch node's false field. 
we can play around with different textures to instantly see different results on the preview windows. Finally, I'll put the first branch node to the colour field on Unlit Master to complete the Game Boy shader. As I mentioned, I want to show you two ways of achieving a Game Boy effect, so I've duplicated the entire Game Boy shader graph and named the new one Game Boy Ramp. You'll see why it's called that shortly. Go to the end of the graph and delete the group of comparison and branch nodes after we calculate the luminance. Also, for this second technique, we don't need the four colour properties, so also delete these. In their place, add a new texture 2D called Ramp Texture. A Ramp Texture lets us encode a gradient of colours to use within a shader. In this case, I've created a texture which contains the four Game Boy colours, each taking up a quarter of the texture's width. If you'd like to use this texture, it's contained in the GitHub repository linked in the description. I've set that as the default value for this property. I also add a Sampler State property called Ramp Sampler State. A sampler state is a collection of settings used to sample a texture. Using one of these, we can overwrite the filter mode and wrap mode of a texture and ignore the settings used in the texture import window. We want to change the wrap mode to clamp to avoid glitches where the luminance calculation equals exactly one or exactly zero, because if the wrap mode is set to repeat, then Unity will blend together the two colors at the far ends of the ramp texture. Use a saturate node to ensure that the luminance is clamped between zero and one and then create a brand new vector 2 using the luminance as the x component. Set the y component to 0.5, then use this vector 2 as a UV coordinate to sample the ramp texture using a sample texture 2D node. Remember to connect the ramp sampler state to the sampler field, and finally output the sample to the color field on Unlit Master to complete this shader. The difference between both approaches is subtle, but you'll notice that the edges tend to be a lot softer when using the texture ramp method. It's down to preference which approach you take, but each has advantages. The property-driven version gives you full control within the material inspector to change the colour values however you'd like, but the ramp texture approach supports an arbitrary colour ramp, so you can encode more than four values at whatever luminance thresholds you'd like. Now that we've completed the Game Boy shader, we'll move on to a SNES-style shader, but first, I'm going to thank my Patreon supporters for making this video and all my other content possible. Certain tiers get access to my videos early, and get their names in the credits of the video, like this. So if you're interested, take a look. Without further ado, let's talk about the SNES. For this effect, we're not going to accurately emulate how the SNES handles colour exactly, because it's actually pretty complicated. It can display 256 colours at a time, out of a total of 32,768. Programming that restriction in a shader would be pretty cumbersome. Instead, we're going to quantize the colors so that each color channel only has a limited range of values. Let's start by creating another new unlit graph called SNES. Add a main texture property of type Texture2D, and then add a new vector1 property called Quantization, with a default value of around 6. It's important that we set the mode to integer for this property. We'll also need to add a use lighting keyword like we did for the Game Boy shader. Give it the same name as reference as before. We'll set up the lighting the same way as before, so add a get lighting node, and then read the main texture using a sample texture 2D node, and multiply the two together. To pick between enabling and disabling the lighting, add a use lighting keyword node, and connect the multiply node to the on field, and the RGBA from the sample texture node to the off field. We're going to perform the quantization calculations on each color channel in turn, so use a split node to separate each color channel. We're going to subtract a small epsilon value so that the color channel value never quite reaches 1, then multiply by the quantization property. After that, use a floor node to truncate the value to an integer. The next step is optional. If we add 0.5, then the final output ends up looking a bit less dark and oversaturated, but feel free to leave this node out if you want. Finally, we need to divide by quantization minus 1 to get our values in the correct range, so drag a divide node off that add node. Then take the quantization property, subtract 1 from it, and pass that into the other pin on the divide node. Remember that we're building a new color, so output this into a new vector free node in its first input pin. Connect that to the color pin on Unlit Master, and you should see the main preview change to red. We could just copy and paste this for each color channel, but earlier we saw that subgraphs are great for reusing code, so select everything in between the split and vector 3 nodes, right click and convert to subgraph. Name this something along the lines of quantize. 
You'll see that, as before, it's replaced everything with a new node, but it's messed up slightly and it takes two quantization inputs, when really it just needs to take one. We can quickly find the subgraph by right clicking the node and selecting Open Subgraph. On the left hand side, the properties of the inputs to the subgraph. We don't need two versions of quantization, so go ahead and delete one of them. Then drag the existing quantize property and plug it into the slot where the duplicate got deleted. I also think the vector1 input can be more descriptive. It's meant to represent a colour channel value, so rename it colour. Similarly, go and change the output's name to outcolor. Back on the snares graph, connect the quantization property to the quantization pin, then copy and paste the pair of nodes a couple of times. Connect the G and B components of the split node to the new quantize nodes, then feed their outputs to the Y and Z components of the vector free respectively to complete the shader. We can play around with different textures and toggle the lighting to see if the difference it makes to the output. The same goes for the Game Boy shader. The difference between lit and unlit is interesting. Furthermore, if we want to make this look a bit more like the NES rather than the SNES, with its far more restrictive colour space, we can just tone down the quantization level. See if you can integrate more interesting lighting using the remainder of Alex's tutorial. I've linked it in the description. For my next shader tutorial, I'm going to deconstruct the Octo Camera mechanic in Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. We'll write the shader to change Snake's camouflage seamlessly between two different textures, and we'll use code to detect the texture on the wall or floor he's leaning or crawling on, whether it's a mesh renderer for the wall, or a Unity terrain for the floor. It's my first time using Unity's newer terrain system, so I'm excited to put the effect together. Until next time, keep on making shaders.